Have you found God's will for your life? Mm, yes. What is it? Well, my heart is in Haiti, in the country of Haiti. What do you want to do there? Build orphanages. Do you want to reach the lost? Oh, yes. Feed them, clothe them, and set them on the path of Christ. Have you found God's will for your life? Um, each and every day I am, yes. Um, I know what he has for me and the plans that he has for me, yeah. What's his plan? Um, I feel that he is calling me to preach the gospel all around the world and eventually live in Africa. As you know. Have you found God's will in your life? I, I think I have. What is it? He wants me to do an outreach. Really? Yeah. Or connect with people who are doing outreach. So you've got a concern for the lost? Yes, definitely. So you've seen God's will is for you to reach out to the lost? I think so. So what's God's will for your life? To go out and tell people about him. When we're faithful to reach out to the lost, God will honor our desires. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his command to do those things that are pleasing in his sight. If anything is pleasing in his sight, it's obedience to the Great Commission. Remember, God is so pleased when we preach the gospel that he sees even the lowliest part of us as beautiful. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. Have you ever studied your feet? Look at your baby toe. Does that look beautiful to you? It's more like a reject jelly bean with hair on it. But if we use those feet to bring the gospel to someone, God calls them beautiful. The Apostle Paul will feel the priority of his heart when he said, To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Those seeking for a personal great commission, in other words, trying to figure out what God's will is for their life, need to go back to the scriptures and to their relationship with Jesus and ask the question, do I know the heartbeat of my God? I think the reason lots of pastors don't share their faith is probably similar than the average layman doesn't share his faith. Uh, it's an uncomfortable situation. And if you can avoid it, and especially for a pastor who might be tempted to rationalize that he's preaching the gospel every week anyway, uh, you know, if, if he can convince himself that he's dispensed with his duty to be a witness because of the preaching that he does, then he, he might be tempted to do that. And unfortunately, I think a lot of men pass up good opportunities to share their faith because they think like that. The very reason God came to this earth and suffered and died on the cross was for the salvation of the world. Has God lost his enthusiasm to see the unsaved come to Christ? Has he changed his mind and is now willing that sinners perish? His will is that none perish and that all come to repentance. To seek and to save that which is lost is to flow in perfect harmony with the will of the Father. After Jesus ascended into heaven, two angels appeared to the disciples and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? So perhaps the inference was, don't stand here gazing up to the heavens. God has granted everlasting life to sinful humanity. Go and take the gospel to the world. We haven't been saved to stand and gaze up to heaven, but to take light to those who sit in the dark shadow of death. How can any person who professes to have the love of God in them be so heavenly minded they're no earthly use? Sinners are going to hell, and we've been commanded to reach out to them. Paul said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. A friend of mine couldn't get a word from God. He didn't know if he should go to New Guinea with a team to construct a church building and to evangelize. Then he heard about a man who was waiting on the Lord. He waited for a long time. He waited, he waited, and he died. So my friend decided he had better go before he died, and he had an incredible time. Now, what do you think happens after someone dies? Where do they go? I believe they go up to heaven. Everybody does? I believe so. So, you've got a Jewish background. I can see you're wearing yes. something around your neck, Star of David. Yes, I am Jewish. So, so am I. So, when you stand before God, do you think he's going to let you into heaven? If you've done the right things throughout your life, yeah, I believe so. So, have you done the right things? I think I have. <laughs> I mean, I've had 
experiences with other different things and I've done wrong. So you've done wrong things like you've broken the commandments? Mm, a little bit, but I think with me talking with, the, with God and he's forgiven me. You sure? I feel it. I feel it like he is, yeah. Um, there's one way to see yourself in truth in God's eyes. It's just to go look at the Ten Commandments for, for a few moments. Like, how many lies do you think you've told in your life? My whole life? Okay. Your whole life. I'd say maybe... 35, 40? 35 or 40. Okay, now here's the, here's the big question. What do you call somebody who tells lies? A liar. Have you ever stolen anything? No, no, that's one thing. That's not number 36, is it? No. <laughs> You're telling me the truth? You've yeah. never taken something long to no. someone? No, I've never stolen. Have you ever used God's name in vain? No. Never once? No. Well, that's commendable. Now, Jesus said if you look with lust, you commit adultery in the heart. Have you ever looked with lust? Sexual desire at another person in your whole life? Mm. You're human, aren't you? Yeah, I well, am. Come on. Yeah. yeah, I have. I got okay. it, yeah. So... How are your sins going to be forgiven? It, you know, it's like when you stand in front of a judge in a court of law and you've broken the law, it's not enough to say to the judge, I'm sorry, judge. You know, you're still going to go to prison if it's a serious crime. Yeah, that's true. And it's the same with God. We can say, God, God, I'm sorry, but he won't forgive us unless a payment is given. Do you remember the Passover? Yes. What happens at Passover? See if you can give me a quick summation. What happens at Passover? Um, we eat. <laughs> yeah, but why do we have Passover? What's the story? Well, it's when the angel of death was going to come over Egypt and the Israelites were told to put the blood of the lamb on the doors and anyone who was in that house, death passed over them because they applied the blood in faith. Okay? That's the Passover. Well, when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming to him for the first time, he said, Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And, and the gospel tells us that God became a human being in Jesus of Nazareth and he suffered and died on the cross taking the punishment for our sins. When he was on the cross, he was paying the fine for the law that you broke. You, got, you broke God's moral law, the Ten Commandments. Jesus paid your fine in his life's blood. It's as simple as this. You broke God's law, the Ten Commandments. Jesus stepped in and paid your fine. That means God can legally dismiss your case now. He can forgive you. He can wash you clean. So when you apply his blood by faith, God's anger will pass over you on the day of judgment because of the suffering, death, and the resurrection of Jesus. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Have you ever heard it before? No, I've never heard it before. Well, what God requires of you is that you repent and trust in him. The moment you do that, God will forgive your sins and he'll grant you everlasting life. He'll give you the gift of everlasting life. And this isn't like pie in the sky when you die. God will reveal himself to you the moment you turn from your sins when you apologize to God, turn from your sins. Elbert Hubbard once said, the world bestows its big prizes both in honors and money, but for one thing, and that is initiative. And what is initiative? I'll tell you, it's doing the right thing without being told. Listen, if you want people to appreciate you, if you really want them to praise you, do the right thing without being told. If a friend drops into a seat exhausted after a day's hard work and you know he loves an ice-cold drink when he's tired, give him one without being told. You'll be praised. David did the right thing when he heard Goliath blaspheming. Peter did the right thing when he wanted to be with Jesus. And you and I do the right thing when we seek and save the lost. The Bible says that we should actually be paying attention to ants. Go to the ant, you slugger. Consider her ways and be wise, which, having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. In California, you don't need to go to the ant because the ant comes to you. If you notice, ants don't need to be continually motivated to work. They're full of initiative. In fact, in my careful study of ants, I have never seen one taken a rest. In fact, the only still ant you see is a dead ant. They're maniacs for work, and God points to them as our example. The great composer is not set to work because he is inspired, but becomes inspired because he is working. Beethoven, Wagner, Bach, and Mozart settled down day after day with as much regularity as an accountant settles down each day with his figures. They didn't waste time waiting for inspiration.